Tonight, the Prime Minister relents. His Chief of Staff will testify on China's election interference. Will he allow Canadians to get to the truth? The standoff. The Conservatives are trying to gin up the toxicity and partisanship. The climb down. We force this government to end the obstruction. And what the committee is hoping to learn. What did the Prime Minister know? When did he know about it? New numbers support claims of racism at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I'm not surprised that racism runs amok inside there. Amid warnings about how to tackle it. I think we need to be really careful. Plus, on patrol in James Smith Cree Nation in the wake of a horrifying stabbing rampage. Not doing that way. Why is that? Because they'll come after us. Our exclusive look at the team struggling to keep their community safe. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, those looking for answers about what the Prime Minister knew on China's interference in Canadian elections are savouring a bit of a victory. Justin Trudeau's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, will testify before a parliamentary committee. If anyone beyond the Prime Minister himself can answer that key question, it's Telford. And that question has been burning in Ottawa for weeks now ever since news reports citing leaks from CSIS detailed a sophisticated Chinese government effort to tilt Canadian elections towards the Liberals. Travis Danraz shows us even before Telford appears, the politics are so incandescent, one MP says he's receiving death threats. After a week's-long filibuster at a committee investigating foreign interference in Canada's elections, a Liberal climbed down. The motion as amended multiple times passes. Katie Telford will testify. It took weeks of pressure for the Prime Minister to back down and flip-flop. Will he allow Canadians to get to the truth and prevent this from happening again before the next election with a full public inquiry now? Yeah. Canadians know this is an extremely serious issue and should not be a partisan issue. But both the Tories and the NDP were quick to claim victory. We force this government to end the obstruction in committee and to allow the chief of staff of the prime minister to testify. Justin Trudeau insists committee testimony from Telford isn't the best way to investigate the issue of foreign interference. The conservatives are trying to uh, gin up the toxicity and partisanship by making political theater, theater out of it and by uh, catching uh, Ms. Telford or others in not being able to answer direct questions. She is a critical witness to get to the heart of the scandal, which is what did the Prime Minister know, when did he know about it, and what did he do or fail to do about Beijing's interference in her elections. But one Toronto MP says some of the accusations at the heart of that interference are false. Okay. I was not offered, I was not told, I was not informed, nor would I accept any help from a foreign country. Han Dong faced cameras for the first time since Global News alleged he may have been involved in a foreign interference network. Because of the news story and all the hateful, uh, aggressive comments, death threats coming my way, it uh, does impact constituents in my writing. So as you say, Travis, the Liberals say talking to Telford isn't the ideal solution. They insist exploring China's election interference is best done by the special rapporteur, David Johnson. A and I suppose we now more precisely know his mandate. Yeah, we absolutely do, Adrian. So that mandate, it was unveiled today. And as part of his investigation, Johnston will examine the last two federal elections and assess if the government did enough to defend Canada from foreign actors. Now, he could also call for a full public inquiry, and he'll make that decision by the end of May. Adrian? All right, Travis Danraj in Ottawa, thank you. Thank you. Tonight, Russian cruise missiles and artillery shells slammed into Ukrainian cities, all within hours of Chinese President Xi Jinping's high-profile visit to Moscow. As Breyer Stewart shows us, both Xi and Vladimir Putin publicly portray themselves as peacemakers, but there's often more under the surface. For President Vladimir Putin, this visit is a chance to show Russia still has friends in high places. President Xi Jinping said that China is on the right side of history when it comes to Ukraine. 
and he said he's committed to the 12-point peace proposal China introduced last month, which was criticized by some for not calling for the withdrawal of Russian troops. Putin warned about Britain's decision to send Ukraine its Challenger 2 tanks equipped with ammunition containing depleted uranium. It looks like the West indeed is ready to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian, he said. Their meeting was held as Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visited Ukraine. Also the same day that Russia released footage showing two of its strategic bombers flying over the Sea of Japan. On the streets of Moscow, there was praise for China and some reverence for Xi. He is, of course, very cool, said this man. China is a friendly country, and we hope for more cooperation. During their public statements, Putin mostly focused on trade. It relies on China even more now to buy its oil and gas, which is increasingly shunned by Europe. For Xi, experts say there is a plan behind his vague Ukrainian peace proposal. Part of China's grand strategy in pushing back against the U.S. alleged global dominance. Alexander Gabuev says China wants to take advantage of Russia's resources and its now weaker economic position, but it needs to try to find a way to make it more palatable. And in order to push back against Western criticism for leading too heavily on the Russian side, you need to come up with a framework on how to talk about this. So she is framing these meetings as a mission of peace instead of just a visit to a useful friend. Ukraine's president said he asked Beijing to join a Ukrainian peace plan, but is still waiting for an answer. Meanwhile, Xi extended an invite of his own to Putin to come and visit him in China. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Russia has summoned the top Canadian diplomat in Moscow to protest comments from Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie. Earlier this month, Jolie referred to regime change in the context of Canada's policy towards Russia, a policy she then stressed was directed only at the Kremlin's ability to attack Ukraine. We need to isolate Russia diplomatically, economically and, um, and, uh, and politically. Uh, and that is the regime that, that I'm uh, referring to. Well, today, Russia's foreign ministry condemned the comments as a Russophobic attack, adding it may take what it calls appropriate countermeasures. Now, Canada's inflation rate sank to 5.2 percent in February. That's down from 5.9 percent in January. It's now the lowest rate in 13 months. So maybe those interest rate hikes are working. But the cost of food has still been rocketing skyward up a punishing 10.6% compared to the previous February. For seven months now, the inflation rate for food has been in the double digits. Nisha Patel tells us which items are getting especially expensive. It's tough not to notice higher food prices, especially for those running this Toronto food bank. The cooking oil. Cooking oil is way high. And almost, some cases, almost double. And uh, rice is going up, sugar is going up, flour is going up. Here, it's the busiest time of year, with the Muslim holy month of Ramadan about to begin. Each day of fasting ends with a special meal called iftar. And there are lots of dates here, you can see it. I just bought 6,000 bags. But as those grocery prices continue to climb, so does the number of food bank users. These days, it's very tough. Mm -hmm. Lots of people lost their jobs, you know, and there are lots of refugee coming community is coming. They hope to serve 7,000 families this month. Many are new Canadians who have been hit hardest by rampant inflation. Grocery bills and everything is very expensive. It is very, very difficult to live, you know, to get food for your family. Big, big thank you for the Muslim food bank because they give us uh, a lot of help. The latest numbers show Canadians are paying nearly 11 percent more for groceries. Prices are surging for juice, cereal and dairy. But meat and veggies aren't rising as fast as before. StatsCan says bad weather is hurting supply. Higher costs for animal feed and packaging play a role too. We may get some slower growth in food price inflation moving forward, but are we going to see an unwind? That seems less likely. Household budgets are also being stretched by mortgage interest costs, up 24 percent. Though lower gas prices and plunging childcare costs are helping inflation cool.
Economists say this gives the central bank room to hold interest rates steady. They're probably not going to be talking about rate hikes anymore. Still, inflation isn't expected to hit the 2% target until next year. And with forecasts of a recession, plus the uncertainty of the current banking crisis, Canada's economy still faces challenges. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. In Halifax, police have charged a 15-year-old student with two counts of attempted murder after two staff members were stabbed at a high school. But it is important to remember that this incident does not define our community. It does not define our schools. So Halifax Police Chief there acknowledging just how traumatic it has been for the community. The student made his first court appearance today. The two staff members are still in hospital. Pretty frightening scene in downtown Vancouver on Sunday when several propane tanks exploded. This incident has reopened calls for a solution to BC's current housing crisis. Susanna Da Silva on the escalating risks as more people sheltering in tents just try to stay warm. Explosions echoed through the downtown east side as firefighters scrambled to reduce the danger, dragging a 100-pound propane tank away from the flames. I was quite shocked, even just the chaos and, and hearing about the damage to a building. Vancouver's fire chief issued an order in July to clear the streets on the downtown east side of an increasing number of tents. Eight months later, the tents have been reduced, but she says the fires are up 20% in the first two months of this year. It's risky behavior. A lot of people, I'm, I'm going to suggest, a lot of it is smoking-related materials, whether it's cigarettes or drugs, and here comes a, a fire. As we talk, an alarm rings out. A tent fire at the corner of Hastings and Maine exactly what I'm concerned about and it doesn't matter any time of the day or night whether the weather's good or bad you know we have a lot of people there a lot of risk. Luckily this fire was put out quickly with the help of people nearby but it's a situation that has local businesses concerned and calling for more creative solutions. We have vacant lots and you could probably squeeze 20 or 30 tiny homes into those lots have them connected to water and, and sewer uh, have them connected to services from uh, nonprofits and that type of thing. BC Housing says 129 new units were made available since July with more on the way. But advocates say real solutions are needed now. We have to stop pretending that people will just agree to freeze. We have to actually engage in their reality and find options that are better than what we have right now. Just make sure there's a wide berth around it. John Henry has been down here five months. The fire department kept shutting us down there, and so they left us no choice but to hide our little fires to keep ourselves warm. And having a fire inside of a tent isn't recommended, and it's definitely not safe, so um, propane is the only way. And a risk many here say they have to take. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Police have recovered another body at the site of last week's fire in Old Montreal. So this brings the death toll of that fire to two. The victim's remains are being sent to a lab for identification. Five other people are still missing. Their friends and families awaiting answers and accountability. Montreal police say they will provide an update tomorrow morning. New numbers show that complaints about racism to Canada's Human Rights Commission were dismissed at a high rate until criticism sparked some changes. But as David Thurton shows us, some say those changes do not go far enough. Memories from a military career tarnished in the end with racist insults. Ruben Coward heard the N-word repeatedly. I received this opprobrious treatment that was so obviously racist. I, when, I, when I got out of the military, I threw the, my uniforms on the dump. But he did keep his paperwork from his 1993 complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. It was dismissed, a trend he says he continues to see as he helps others with their complaints. I've had the opportunity of uh, dealing with the Canadian Human Rights for over 30 years now. And uh, I'm not surprised that racism runs amok. That is what Commission employees told CBC News. And new numbers back that up. In 2020, 13% of race-based claims were dismissed compared to 7% of other claims. However, in 2022, 9% of race-based claims were dismissed compared with 14% of others. 
That's around the time the commission said it changed the way it processed race-based claims in response to criticism. But there are concerns that's not enough. It is worrisome. This lawyer says the method the commission uses to process complaints gives too much discretion to agency staff. We would like to see uh, a direct access model where people are able to bring their complaints themselves or with a lawyer or legal representative. Cindy Blackstock helped bring a successful claim against the federal government for discriminating against First Nations children in the child welfare system. She fears a direct process could lead to backlogs. I think we need to be really careful about um, not, uh, not introducing ideas that may have the unfortunate side effect of gutting our human rights system when we need it the most. The Canadian Human Rights Commission believes the current model still works and its anti-racism plan is now helping to close the justice gap. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. London's Metropolitan Police Service is on notice. Clean up or be blown up and reorganized. Margaret Evans has the details of a damning report released today. Scathing isn't a strong enough word to describe it. The report brands Britain's largest police force, the Metropolitan, as being institutionally racist, sexist, misogynistic and homophobic. There is, without doubt, a discriminatory culture right across the Metropolitan Police. It's not in pockets, it pervades the whole organisation. The report was commissioned in 2021, after a young woman named Sarah Everard was abducted, raped and murdered by a serving Metropolitan Police officer. Since then, another serving Met officer was revealed as one of Britain's most prolific serial rapists. Investigations into those cases revealed serious failings on the part of the Met. The report is 300 pages long and there's plenty of damning testimony to choose from. Rape kits left or lost in overcrowded fridges. Initiation ceremonies where new recruits were urinated on. A Muslim police officer who had bacon put in his boots. It's ghastly, isn't it? You sit down and read that report and it generates a whole series of emotions. The police commissioner has vowed to root out the problems outlined in Baroness Casey's report, but he rejects her use of the word institutional. I understand her use of the term institutional. It's not a term I use myself. Critics say that's a mistake. Parm Sandu is a former police chief superintendent who resigned when her own allegations of racism were ignored. We need action to protect the public. And instead of having arguments about what terminology we should be using, let's see the action plan. Let's see what we're going to do next. There are those who doubt the force can change. An earlier report, commissioned in the wake of a bungled investigation into the murder of a black teenager named Stephen Lawrence, also pointed to institutional racism in the Met Force. That was more than 20 years ago now. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. There is more chaos tonight on the streets of Paris. Those are some of the thousands who continue to demonstrate against the government's pension reforms pushed through Parliament this week without a vote. It raises the retirement age from 62 to 64. The change threatened to topple Emmanuel Macron's government. France's president says it's needed to sustain the pension system. He is expected to say more tomorrow in a TV interview. Tens of millions of people are without internet in the northern India state of Punjab, and they have been for days. It's been blocked and gatherings restricted, all in the name of finding one man on the run. Ithil Musa brings us the details on the Sikh separatist leader who has authorities on edge. Police in India's Punjab state are desperately trying to find Amrit Paul Singh. For a fourth straight day, authorities have blocked internet access for about 27 million people to prevent unrest as police continue their manhunt of Singh. The self-styled preacher openly supports the Khalistan movement, which seeks to create a sovereign state for Sikhs in India. Violent clashes have erupted over the years between followers of the movement and the Indian government. But Singh claims his true fight is against drug abuse, which has ravaged India's northern state. I'm standing with my own people. There will be consequences, I know that. 
But what I can do? You want me to be silent, let my people die? I can't do that. One expert says Singh's anti-drug stance is resonating with younger Punjabis. His message was that youth need to get off drugs and return to their roots. Uh, and he was actually quite successful. Last month, hundreds of Singh supporters stormed a police station, demanding the release of an aide who had been arrested. Now, he and his supporters stand accused of attempted murder, obstruction of law enforcement, and creating disharmony. Police say more than 100 people have been arrested since Saturday. Some experts say targeting Singh and his followers is about India's Hindu nationalist government silencing dissent. In fact, minority communities, whether that's uh, the Sikh community or Muslims or Christians, they've all been saying for a very long time that they're under siege. Punjab's high court is now demanding to know how Singh managed to elude a police force with 80,000 officers for days. The court has ordered the state government to submit a report on search operations, which it's calling an intelligence failure. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. A new security force is keeping watch in James Smith Cree Nation, but fear of more violence remains. We're seeing too many people dying out here. Why residents are worried about the future, but first. Proof Atlantic Canada is outperforming other provinces. That's something that we've been working toward. Uh, for uh, for 60 years. The pros and cons of a Maritimes on the rise. And decades of supporting others comes full circle. It's quite a thing. People help me out a lot and I help it to uh, keep on being a, a good guy for them, you know. We are back in two. Atlantic Canada could be poised for an economic boom. A new report by a think tank shows there have been big improvements over the past 15 years. But as Kate McKenna shows us, the growth also makes life less affordable. This skyline is changing. Halifax and other Atlantic Canadian cities are on the cusp of a boom. That's the finding of a new study. There's a distinct buzz to Atlantic Canada's economy, according to the Ottawa-based think tank Public Policy Forum. It's have not, no more. So we wondered, look, is this, is this Atlantic bubble going to come out of the, uh, uh, the pandemic as an Atlantic boom? The think tank studied the region's economy over the last 15 years. It found big improvements. People are moving to Atlantic Canada. The result is more investment and jobs, according to Public Policy Forum's president and CEO, Edward Greenspan. And over the recent years, we've been looking at a region that's trying to and getting close to breaking out. It's a different economic situation than what the then leader of the opposition, Stephen Harper, famously described 20 years ago. Uh, there is a uh, dependency in the region that breeds uh, a culture of defeatism. Well, there is a feeling of finally, um, and uh, there's also a feeling, uh, Kate, that this comes with raised expectations. Former PEI Premier Wade McLaughlin says immigration created more business. We should uh, keep going because this is, this is working and this is good for us and it's something that we've been working toward uh, for, uh, for 60 years. But it's not all good news. Hundreds of thousands of Atlantic Canadians don't have access to a family doctor and the report finds that that situation is not improving. Plus, the cost of housing is soaring. The one big problem we have here is housing, big time. That's, it's the rent's gone up and it's really hard for us that is on social assistance to try, try to get a place. The report does show more homes are being built, but there's no guarantee that prices will even out. The report says it's up to governments to make sure this rising tide floats all boats. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Halifax. Security has been beefed up on James Smith Cree Nation, but the people tasked with the job say they don't have what they need to keep people safe. We're not going that way. Why is that? Because they'll come after us. An exclusive look at the operation and the residents still concerned for their safety. And rumors are still swirling about a potential Donald Trump indictment. And this case could take not just weeks, but months and months to play out. So what could happen next? The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next.
Well, James Smith Cree Nation remains shaken and traumatized tonight, more than six months after a stabbing rampage left 11 people dead. A community watch unit now patrols the streets, but it has limited training and resources, and many in the community are still afraid. Olivia Stefanovic and our investigative team got exclusive access to a community determined not to be defined by this tragedy. Anyone north? Negative. 10 4, going north. 10 4, you're in 4. Past midnight in James Smith Cree Nation, Stewart Head spots trouble behind the band office. Four in the car, three are drunk. The driver's sober. He's on patrol with the Saskatchewan First Nations new security team. This truck is, uh, it has its own beacon lights. Since September 4th, the band has paid for more than two dozen people to watch over the community. They look like police, but they're unarmed. Just six months ago, 11 people were stabbed to death, 17 more injured by community member Miles Sanderson before he died too. We see another group gathered, but have to turn away. Okay. There's some people there. We're not going that way. Why is that? Because they'll come after us. That's a big group of, uh, that's a party over there. Okay. Sanderson's rampage haunts the streets and every home. All right, so this is the door that he kicked in. Well, the Burns family still feels vulnerable. Okay, so it's still loose here. Yes, yeah. Actually, it doesn't even lock at all. You know, just walk in, it's just an ugly reminder. Unnerving, especially for her mom, Joyce, one of the survivors. Okay. Stab me on my arm, my neck. And when he hit me on my, stabbed me in my, ab, my ab, abdomen, mm -hmm. that's when I fell. She believes she's only alive today because her husband, Earl Burns Sr., sacrificed his final breaths to distract Sanderson. What's the hardest part for you? Getting up. Getting up from the bedroom or leaving the house. They don't even want to leave the house. The shadow of the early September morning attack still darkens their day to day. I can't even explain that. The, the dreams and the flashbacks come and go. And this whole thing just, the grief just comes in waves. Sierra Twist lost her dad, Christian Head, who left behind 20 grandchildren. My dad taught us how to live life with him, but he didn't teach us how to live life without him. This is uh, my unit, Unit 1. There's uh, Stewart three, Head uh, is Sierra's uh, uncle. He returned to James Smith to make things right. Do you think of your brother when you drive out here? Yeah. A lot. What do you think of? I live in his house. Every morning, where he was laying dead, I, I sit there on the floor. I say a little prayer and then away I go. All these tracks you see going in the ditch, these are all drunk drivers. Since the RCMP are usually at least an hour away, Head and his team are the first on scene to any emergency. The problem is they have no training, no powers. I talk with RCMP. Uh, I ask questions like, can we take the keys out? No, you can't. Well, why not? They're drunk. How about if I bump the vehicle that they're drunk driving in? Would I be able to do that and call in a car accident? You can't do that. That must be frustrating to get all these no's. Well, why not? Yeah. We're, I could be saving a life. Mm -hmm. Just keeping an eye on them, and they know it. They're also putting their own lives on the line. They only come out at night. 
That morning, the RCMP arrested a man for pointing a BB gun at a security officer. Another scare for Head and his team, who had just been threatened. He said he was going to kill his whole family, his wife, and all of the security, and he was going to break Miles Sanderson's record. What worries you the most? <sighs> Another incident, like September 4th. And we're thinking it's going to happen, and it's probably going to involve um, firearms. I am. I am worried that, that that could happen again. And if it did happen again, would it be would it be worse than what it was? Every night we make sure, you know, certain things are, are, are done within our own home, like that our doors are locked, that the curtains are closed. And those are like things that are, are is our reality now. Marge Wichahin says the counselors she works with at the health clinic are trying to calm nerves. I don't think that, that, that our wellness team is um, big enough in the numbers, I guess, to be, to be able to support the amount of, um, of that's needed in the community, like the trauma, the, uh, mental, the mental health. Inside the council chambers, a state of emergency remains in place. This is our command post <clears throat> from September 4th. Why have you kept this up here? That's a good question, and um, you know, every time I look at it, it always reminds, reminds me of the people that, you know, that we lost. But Chief Wally Burns of James Smith Cree Nation tries to keep an eye on hope, fueled by people who suffered their own tragedy. Where are these from? Uh, the hearts and the wall are from Humboldt, and I'm very happy, to, you know, that uh, for their sympathy. The pain is real. The emotions are high. And uh, even just one, you know, a, a slam of a door, just, you know, a lot of us just get scared. But, you know, I'd rather combat uh, the heavy drugs. He knows that will require the community's so own police there. force, something All he wants to see in place too. within the year. I think it'll make a, a big difference. I like how other First Nations protect their nations. They run out the drug dealers. As another 12-hour shift begins for Stewart Head, he worries about what the night could bring. We're seeing too many people dying out here. I myself, all my friends my age are all dead. Car accidents, suicides. drug over, overdoses and it's really hard to see um, the damage that this um, all these drugs brings and alcohol brings here it is really really hard all he can do is be there to help. And me, I love all my people here. Every damn one of them. Facing danger with nothing more than a truck, a radio, and a flashlight. Olivia, as you mentioned, that security patrol team seems a little light on resources. Are there plans to improve their safety on the job? Well, Adrian, in the short term, security officers like Stuart Head are expected to get self-defense training. But in the long run, to make the community safer, people in James Smith say they need to get together to tackle drugs and alcohol. The problem is they haven't had a band meeting in years. So now Chief Byrne says he plans to get the community together sometime in the spring. And what about accessing uh, mental health support? Well, Chief Burns is concerned that the health clinic is in the band office. So now the federal government says it will give the community more than $870,000 to buy two trailers so they can expand counseling services. And to do so with privacy. Exactly. All right, Olivia Stefanovich in Ottawa, thank you. You're welcome. All eyes are on New York as rumors swirl about a potential Donald Trump indictment. They eventually have to get to a jury of the peers of the accused. 
what this former DA says could be happening behind the scenes. Those are protesters outside a New York City courthouse condemning Donald Trump. The city is bracing for a possible indictment of the former president over alleged payment of hush money to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Trump suggested he would be arrested today. He urged supporters to protest. If indicted, he would be the first president in U.S. history to be charged with a crime. So let's look at how all of this could play out legally. Jeremy Saland was the former Manhattan assistant district attorney, the office that is investigating all of this. He's in Chappaqua, New York tonight. So Jeremy, I understand the thinking that former President Trump wanted to get ahead of this, wanted to energize his supporters, but what would make him think he's going to be arrested today? You know, I, I don't know if he really thought he was going to be arrested today. A lot of this is controlling the narrative, controlling the story. Remember, President Trump's theme has always been, I am protecting you from them. They're not coming at me directly. They're coming at me, but they really want to get to you. So if he controls that storyline that this is an ethical, um, political prosecution, well, then he could control the storyline that they, meaning law enforcement, who's out to get all of you, leaked it. And it's just a continuation of that narrative. And if he thinks it's coming... Why not get out in front and tell the story as he wants to tell it? Mm -hmm. So uh, because you were the former assistant DA in Manhattan, can you take us, though, behind those doors now? What is your instinct telling you about what kinds of conversations are happening now? What's being weighed out here? So I think, I think what's being going on here, there's, there's the first and foremost is it's important that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office make the people know that this is not a political prosecution that this is based on merit. And while some have called it a zombie prosecution, meaning it sort of died and disappeared and now it's come back, that that's because they've been doing their due diligence. And we all hope that that's certainly the truth and we deserve, or they deserve, pardon me, to let them prove their case should it go that way. But I think that that is very critical that it's the, it's the, the sharing with the public and giving them the confidence that this is a genuine, legal, moral per prosecution. So you just said something interesting there. We all hope that this is the case. Does that leave the window open? Is it possible that there is some political motivation here? Could he and they be right about that? Anything is possible, right? I don't think either one of us could say that's not possible. But we'd like to think and we ought to give credit to law enforcement to do their due diligence. And remember, they always have to prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's not just to a grand jury, which is a different body, establishing that there's reasonable cause to believe that a felony was committed, but they eventually have to get to a jury of the peers of the accused, in this case Donald Trump, and it's not going to pass their sniff test if it turns out this is a fraud, that if it turns out this is really some sort of political effort. So, you know, do I think that that's a concern? It should always be a concern, but it shouldn't color the investigation or color my view. Let's hear the evidence. And to what you said about this being, you know, some people calling it a, a zombie case or a zombie prosecution, this investigation started a long time before the current DA took office. So, so why is this happening now? Why this case? Why not the January 6th case, not the Georgia election interference case? Is it just because it was the first one that happened? Well, let's also be clear. There's different jurisdictions, and, and we're talking about Manhattan. And while Manhattan, New York County, often has its you know, proverbial hands all over the place, across the world, across the United States, January 6th is not New York City. It's not Manhattan. So they have what they have. The evidence is what, what it is as it relates to New York. And the, the real, when you break it down, core to all of this is whether or not, as we understand it, that this $130,000 that ultimately went to Michael Cohen, Mr. Trump's attorney, um, was not recorded properly, and it was recorded as payments when, in fact, it was, pardon me, let me restate that, recorded as legal service payments as opposed to something else, meaning Stormy Daniels. That's what this is. we got to keep this tight. And the argument is, in the event that this was done, was there also an effort to conceal another crime or commit another crime which would raise this to a felony? And one last thought. In the event, we don't know, in the event he gets indicted, how does this play out time-wise? I mean, are we potentially looking at someone who could be campaigning actively for president and undergoing a trial at the same time? Well, 
he can certainly be under indictment and facing an up, you know, impending trial or pending trial. Absolutely, because if the grand jury votes an indictment, let's say they do it this week sometime, there's going to be a surrender within days or immediately, and then this case could take not just weeks but months and months to play out because there's a lot of novel issues that I'm confident the defense will try to exploit and address and say, hey. Even though it may appear that this is a good case, there are real legal hurdles that are missed here, and it should be dismissed. So this is not going away anytime soon. You could absolutely see an ongoing case towards a trial uh, coming up to an election. All right, Jeremy Salan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. The future of outdoor rinks is in jeopardy, but hope is not lost. So that heat, which is waste here, becomes beneficial heat for homeowners in the neighborhood. The work being done to sustain a national pastime. Plus, after years of helping others, this man got a little help from his friends in our moment. Legendary singer and songwriter Bruce Springsteen tonight added another accolade to his vast collection. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> In a ceremony at the White House, President Joe Biden presented the multi-award winning artist with the National Medal of Arts. That's the highest honor for those advancing the arts in the United States. The Empress of Soul, Gladys Knight, and actress Mindy Kaling were among the other recipients. So a classic Canadian winter activity is under threat from a warming climate. Outdoor skating is getting harder and more expensive to maintain. Emily Chung shows us some of the efforts to just keep it going. When we think of a Canadian winter in our nation's capital, this is what we picture. But this winter has been a mild one across eastern Canada, and for the first time in its history as an outdoor skating rink, Ottawa's Rideau Canal never opened for skating. Winters are getting warmer, and in other parts of the world, many cities are giving up the winter tradition of outdoor ice rinks. This year, San Jose, California, Monaco, and Tulle, France were among those that replaced them with roller rinks instead, citing high energy costs. In France, eco-conscious mayors have argued for years that outdoor ice rinks weren't sustainable in their warming climate. One of the challenges is the fact that refrigerated rinks are far more expensive. They also use refrigerants and energy, which contribute to the, the root source of this, which is greenhouse gas emissions. But in Canada, outdoor skating is part of our culture and identity. And cities like Mississauga, Ontario, are looking for ways to keep it alive. Climate change is a factor. Uh, as we look at the winter and we look at ice, um, you know, we really have to look at synthetic surfaces, certainly refrigerated surfaces. A few years ago, North Vancouver, BC, built its largest outdoor rink in the Waterfront Shipyards District. I'm glad we, we followed through and was able to make this come to realization, but some of the challenges obviously are having an outdoor skating rink in a temperate climate. The city has found a way to offset some of the higher energy use and costs of running a refrigerated outdoor rink in a mild climate. Refrigeration systems use energy to remove heat. Instead of dumping that heat, this one feeds it into local buildings for water and space heating. So that heat, which is waste here, becomes beneficial heat for homeowners in the neighborhood. Reducing the natural gas they burn, making the ice rink two to three times more efficient than a regular rink. Boosting efficiency makes a difference, but cities across Canada will need to consider many ideas and options to sustain outdoor skating as our winters get warmer. Emily Chung, CBC News, Mississauga. That smiling man is Mike Gallant in his new truck. What makes it very special is that that truck was gifted to him by the community he has spent decades supporting. So to help others, Mike relied on his vehicle. But when his truck broke down, other people stepped up. And tonight, that's our moment. I've been involved with the uh, African and Caribbean, the black community here since the late 1970s, early 80s. Then I got to get to know some of the African students at the university and then some people from around here. Help them out with their, uh, when they have an events going on and uh, when they want to move and stuff like that. Donc euh, voilà, c'est quelqu'un qui a été toujours au service, euh, qui a mis sa disponibilité au service des, euh, de la communauté immigrante de Moncton. That's why they helped me. My truck broke down and I couldn't get it repaired. J'ai estimé 
que c'était important pour nous de faire quelque chose pour lui. Et c'est comme ça que l'idée est venue de lancer la, la campagne levée de fonds. On a pu quand même mobiliser 4000 et quelques dollars qui nous a permis d'acheter ce, ce camion-là. C'est quite a thing. People help me out a lot and I help it to uh, keep on being a, a good guy for them, you know. What a kind and gentle gesture for a kind and gentle man. So for 40 years, Mike has been using his previous truck just to, you know, lift furniture, run errands, anything he could. So clearly means a lot. That is a national for this March the 21st. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.